Hunters. And uh, very happy to be here. Uh, good to see you all uh, made it here. Uh, today, the topic of today's talk is going to be an open policy agent. No, uh, anyone used OPA in the past? Yeah, quite a few. So it um, might be a, a lot of things that you uh, might know already. It's going to be like an introduction, but uh, we might touch on some more advanced topics as well. Uh, first off, I'm Anders. I work as a developer advocate at Styra, which is the inventors of the OPA project and still the, the maintainers of it as well. Uh, I have a pretty long background in software development where I used to work primarily in identity systems. So the kind of systems where you uh, authenticate primarily, multi-factor authentication, and single sign-on, solutions like that. Uh, and what kind of got me into or interested in OPA was uh, when, you, when you're in identity and authentication, you kind of tend to shy away from authorization. That's, that's the concern of somebody else. Uh, and eventually I got interested, like, what if that was my uh, concern? Uh, how would I tackle that? And I used to work for a, a large uh, corporation where we integrated OPA in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a big microservice environment. Uh, a highly distributed environment, about 700 microservices or so. So that's how I got involved in the, in the OPA project. And uh, yeah, I, I guess I had so much fun. So eventually uh, I, I landed at Styra. Uh, when I'm not coding or working with OPA, my interests are cooking, food, football. And if you want to reach out uh, later, just my first name and my last name at most of these social channels. So to start off, what's the challenge or what problem is it that we're trying to solve uh, with OPA? It's basically this, we're trying to manage policy uh, in increasingly distributed, complex, and heterogeneous systems. And when we say policy, what we, what we basically mean is, is a set, set of rules. And our, uh, our application stacks are, are quite complex. If you go to any uh, larger organization, chances are pretty good. You'll find a, a few of these logos. Or if it's a really large organization, you might even find all of them. And of course, your, your applications uh, will have to live somewhere. Uh, it's going to have to run somewhere. And your infrastructure is going to have to run somewhere as well, as well as your data. And of course, it's not like OPA invented the concept of rules. That's been there uh, all along. So, uh, but the challenge here is basically that all of these systems have their own way of managing policy or managing rules. And it, what we kind of found is that this doesn't really scale when you start to add more and more of these logos and when you start to have like these 700 microservices. How do you know which rules are deployed to any particular system at any particular uh, point in time? So the goal of OPA is to unify policy enforcement across the whole stack. And it's basically what, uh, what OPA does. So if that's what OPA does, uh, what is OPA? It's, uh, it's a general uh, purpose policy engine. Uh, and we'll go into detail on uh, the general purpose bit a, a, a later, but it kind of has to be a general purpose in order to you know, encompass all these uh, diverse different technologies. So it provides a unified tool set and the framework for working with policy across the stack. It decouples uh, policy from application logic. That's uh, kind of a key uh, concern for us. So uh, the way you can think of it is like how you decouple storage from your application and move that into a database. You can kind of think of OPA uh, doing the same, but for a policy and the rule. So the rules don't no longer live inside of your application, but they are uh, properly decoupled. So you can uh, manage your rules, uh, test your rules, and so on, uh, independently from, from that of your business logic. Policies, uh, they're written in a declarative language called Rego, which I'll uh, give you a little demo on later. Uh, one thing to note is uh, OPA deals with the decision-making of policies. So based on, on the policies you have, the rules you have, OPA will provide you a decision. Uh, OPA does not enforce decisions, though. That's still up to your applications. And, and that's obviously highly context-specific uh, based on uh, what layer you are in the stack and so on. 
So it could be anything from uh, sending back a 403 forbidden response, or it could be uh, adding a, a, a log entry to the audit log, or I don't know, contacting the authorities, depending on uh, the severity. So uh, a general purpose policy engine. So we have some use cases uh, pretty much everywhere, but some, some of the most popular ones include uh, admission control, Kubernetes, microservice or app authorization, uh, infrastructure or infrastructure policies, data source filtering, uh, CI/CD pipeline, so on. So basically, anywhere where you have rules, uh, OPA is a, a good fit. It's uh, again, it's an open source project and a, and a pretty vibrant community. We have over 300 contributors, uh, 80 or more uh, major integrations with different products like Kafka or Kubernetes, data sources, and and whatnot. Uh, we're used by over a uh, or over a thousand uh, other GitHub projects, so uh, dependents. Uh, Seven thousand GitHub stars, six thousand three hundred Slack users, one hundred thirty million downloads, etc. So it's a it's a fairly established project by now. So OPA itself uh, it is kind of the core product or project. Well, the ecosystem also includes things like Comptest for for running policies on on files. Uh, OPA Gatekeeper for Kubernetes submission control, there are editor integrations for VS Code, IntelliJ, and so on. But of course, uh, OPA is not just like a hobbyist open source project, but it's uh, actually used by uh, some of the largest organizations in the world. And I said a little summary of, of this uh, up until now, like uh, from Kelsey Hightower said, the Open Policy Agent project is super dope. I finally have a framework that helps me translate written security policies into executable code for every layer of the stack. That's basically what, what OPA provides. So if that's what OPA is, how does it work? So the first uh, thing to keep in mind is, is this. It's a policy decision model. It's kind of how, how, how can OPA integrate with all these services and all, all, all these different technologies. And, and most of these technologies, they, had, they didn't have OPA in mind when they, when they created those. So we, we kind of had to shoehorn in uh, OPA somehow. So how does that work? So the decision model works like this. We have a service. And that service, we have a pretty broad definition of service. It can basically be anything. Anything that services a request from a user or another service. It could, it could be a Kafka broker. It could be a microservice. It could be a Linux PAM module or uh, whatnot. So anything that services a request, uh, when that request uh, kind of comes in or is uh, dispatched, rather than making a decision of our own, we'd rather kind of forward that uh, <laughs> or further on to OPA. So we ask OPA for a decision instead. And we do that via policy query. A policy query is basically just any kind of JSON uh, value. So some common things that you'd normally include would probably be the name of the user, uh, what the endpoint, maybe the request method, things like that, things that have uh, meaning in this context. And uh, based on the policy that we've written and uh, optionally uh, external data, we OPA makes a decision and sends back a policy decision to the service. And that response is also just JSON. So basically any technology that uh, can read and write JSON can, can talk to OPA, given that there's uh, some way of you know, plugging, plugging that in. So that's the decision model. As for deployment, OPA is uh, a self-contained, uh, lightweight uh, binary. I think it's like 50 megabytes or so. Uh, and the common mo deployment model, again, we're working with distributed systems. So the common deployment model is not that you'd run like one gigantic uh, OPA server, but rather that you deploy OPA uh, inside of your services or as close as possible to your services. And uh, the one of the benefits of that is, of course, that you can distribute whatever policy and data is needed only for that particular service, but also that you keep the latency uh, down uh, to, to as, a, a low, uh, as low as minimum. Uh, so yeah, in, in a Kubernetes context, that would normally be a sidecar deployment. You have OPA running inside of the same pod as your, um, as your application. There are many ways of doing it, but ideally as close to your service as possible. 
Uh, Opa normally is deployed as a as a server, so it's queried over its REST API, and uh, yeah, on on in, inside of the same pod, that would just be a call to localhost basically. So it, it's normally uh, below uh, or sub millisecond in, in, in latency overhead. So it's 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 uh, very fast. But there's also a few other deployment options. There's uh, a Go library for Go applications. You can in integrate it with Envoy and Istio-based applications and other service meshes. Uh, you can compile your policy to WebAssembly and, and more. So there's, a, there's really a, a, a lot of way to, uh, ways to deploy OPA, which is also kind of key when you need to integrate with all this, uh, these technologies. So the policies themselves, uh, they're Again, they're written in a declarative language called Rego. And yeah, by declarative, we mean that rather than saying like exactly how you want something evaluated or how you want something done, you just say what you want done. And then it's up to OPA to kind of translate that into instructions. So just like a real world policy, an OPA policy is just a number of rules. So one of the goals is, is kind of to try and translate what is a real world rule and trying to make that, trying to make something as close to that as possible. Rules uh, commonly return true or false. Is the user allowed or not? That's a, a Boolean decision. But again, any 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 value that's uh, valid JSON is also a valid uh, response or a valid decision. Uh, OPA provides a, a unit test framework, so you can work with testing of your policies and rules, um, kind of detached from from that of your business logic uh, or uh, application state. It's a well-documented project, and there's uh, a Rego playground to try to try out policy offering without like even having to download OPA. So at this point, uh, let's see if we can get a demo going here. I'm just gonna see. So just to to kind of show the the basics of policy offering. So the first thing I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna create a policy file. Let's go policy.rego. Is it big enough, or should I? Bigger. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to add a package. And this is similar to a module or a namespace and from other languages. Just, just a name, really. So we're just going to call this policy. And now uh, for the anatomy of a policy, a policy, again, we said a policy is a set of rules. So that's what we're going to add. And in this case, we're going to add a rule, which is uh, a called allow, which makes sense for a, for a Boolean rule. Are we allowed or not? But allow doesn't have a meaning to OPA. Uh, OPA doesn't have like uh, any keywords like that. Uh, so allow or deny is, is just names that make sense to us. So we're just going to say allow is equal to true. And, and here's the kind of the, uh, the thing with rules is that they're basically conditional uh, assignments. So if you'd, in a normal language, you'd say like if something, 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 then assign. Uh, true to the allow rule, but, it, but since uh, the conditions are the actual rules, uh, OPA can it inverts that. So we'd rather than saying allow or if this and this and that is true, then do that. We kind of say then or uh, or do this if all of these conditions are met. So we're going to add a, a rule body here, and. Uh, if all of the conditions or assertions inside of the, the rule body are true, uh, this is going to evaluate. Or, so the allow is going to be assigned to true. So if we do something like 1 is equal to 1, we know that to be true. And then we say OPA eval. We're going to say uh, the policy file there, uh, data policy allow. Yeah, we can make it pretty as well. We can see that that was indeed true. Is it big enough or yeah. no? <laughs> it's better. Yeah. Okay, let's try it again. So, OPA eval, uh, data policy allow. That's the rule we want to allow here. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, that looks better. But it's gonna cut out there in the something like that. Okay. Uh, so the allow rule is true because one is obviously equal to one. And if we do something which is not true and we evaluate that, 
It's just empty. There's nothing there. I mean, meaning the rule is undefined. So if, if we do want to ensure that there's always some value return, we might say that by default, the allow rule is equal to false. That's a pretty good default for any uh, authorization system, isn't it? So of course, and, and if, we, if we were to say like one is equal to one, uh, two is equal to two, and so on, OPA is gonna eval uh, from line if the first line is true, it's going to continue on to the next. If that one is true, it's going to continue on to the next. So if e each of the conditions in the body are met, the whole rule evaluates. And, and if one of them is not true, uh, that's evaluation stops and we fall back to the default value. So it's kind of an inverted uh, if condition. Now, of course, uh, these examples are just silly. So in a, real, in a real example, we might, we're going to provide a policy query, right? So we're, we're going to simulate something like that here. I'm just going to create a file called input.json, and it's going to look something like that. We might have a user. That seems reasonable. We have a name. We're going to say Anders. And the user might have some roles. We could just say this is a developer. And we might have a request. This was a microservice or something. We might say that request might have a method, which could be get here, and a path, or path over the, like path component. So it's going to say users. This could be a string as well, where we just have like slash separated. But I think find it easier to work with an array of values. Okay, so now we have a we have a, a request coming into our service. We have a user here in the request, uh, a name of the user, and we have uh, some roles. We also have a request method. So uh, once we have an input, we can reference any value from that input by just saying input input uh, dot user roles. For example, if we want to reference the roles. And here we might try some iteration. Uh, we could do something like that. We're not interested in, in the actual key here or the ordinal. So we're just going to say if. So if we iterate over all the rules or the roles and one of them is equal to admin, then allow is going to be true. That, that's, that seems like a sensible rule. So uh, what if we want to, we said like inside of the, inside of the rules, uh, Remember how we checked all the conditions. So they're kind of added together. They all need to be true. What if we wanted to add more conditions here? Uh, we might, for example, have uh, some public endpoints where we don't want to require uh, any rules, at least not for, for reading. So the way we do that would be an or condition, right? And the way we do that in Rego is just to add another rule. We could say that allow is equal to true, either if you're an admin or, or the other. So all of these allow rules are going to be evaluated. And if one of them is true, uh, the, the, the final evaluation is also true. So we might want to say input, if input request, request method is equal to get, and the input request path, we could just say like the first path component, if that's equal to users, I think it was, right? So every, everyone should be able to read from the user's endpoint or, or to read users. So that makes it, that makes sense as well. You don't need a, any particular role for doing that. You can, and we can allow that for anyone. So if we tried it out, okay, we're false because we did not provide the input data here. We see that, yeah, indeed, that's true because we were uh, sending a, a GET request to the user's endpoint. If we tried something else here, I don't know, sending one to the admin endpoint, we are uh, no longer allowed. So that's basically how, uh, how policy evaluation works. Some simple uh, assertions based on, on the input you provide to, to OPA. And we could, I think we have time for 
one more example. We might, for example, say that we now said that anyone can read uh, users. It's fine. But if you want to modify a user, it must be your own user. So it must, it must correspond to, to the username in the request. So we could say that allow is equal to true if input request method is equal to put and input request path. And in this case, we're going to say the first path component should be users and the second one should be the user from the request. So input user name. So uh, with this rule, we should be able to modify, change this to put request, and say users, there's. So th we should be allowed to do this, try it out, and we are. And if we change now the path, to try and modify Jane, we should no longer be allowed, and we aren't. So that's basically uh, a very brief uh, introduction to Rego uh, and how you can uh, build uh, your policies from these small uh, rules and how they're all uh, combined into uh, something bigger. And of course this is uh, very simplified. There's a, a, a whole lot more to Rego than this uh, in terms of iteration, uh, built-in functions. There's over 170 built-in functions so if you want to ensure things like all email addresses must end with acmecorp.com or, or whatnot. So, uh, but but uh, the basic principles are all, all contained in here. It's rules are built from uh, simple assertions, and in in this case we had a boolean rule which returns true, but this could be one or uh, it could be yes. It could be any, again any any value that is valid JSON is also a valid decision. All right, so let's hop back here. Any questions on uh, like Rego or policy offering? Yeah. Yeah. So the question was, should it should the input also always be a JSON JSON format? And yes, uh, Opa supports uh, JSON and JAML by default. So. Uh, if you have a, any, any other format, you're advised to kind of convert to that before submitting it to OPA. There are, uh, there are some projects around OPA, like ConfTest, which has a, uh, supports a whole lot more file formats. Uh, but OPA, the core engine, is JSON or JAML. So it needs to be like structured data. OK, so kind of, yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. So, so one of the one of the kind of ideas of having decouple your policy from your application state is that uh, the policies can be updated uh, independently of the lifecycle of your applications. So, if you have seven hundred microservices and you want to add another role or you want to add another rule here, it's kind of inconvenient having to redeploy seven hundred microservices. So that so that's one of the ideas, and it's I'll I'll kind of get into that a bit later on the management features. But yeah, OPA can, can be configured to kind of pull uh, periodically for uh, to pull down configuration or policy and data from, from remote endpoints, for example. Okay, so with some basics, with some basic knowledge of Rego, uh, I kind of figured we can take a look at uh, one of the more common use cases, which is Kubernetes admission control. Uh, and before we dive into OPA and how that works, we can end a, a little reminder of how the, the Kubernetes API works. So it's, it's basically whenever you do something like kubectl apply, uh, your application or a deployment or whatever, uh, that request kind of passes a, mod, uh, a series of modules. And so any request needs to be authenticated, need to be authorized, and it will also pass uh, the admission controllers, which can either mutate the request requests on its way in, or just validate that uh, this looks all right. These modules are chainable, so you can have as many authorizers or admission controllers as you want. And uh, of course, Kubernetes comes with a, a whole bunch of, of built-in modules for, 
for all of these like R back for authorization and uh, a whole bunch of admission controllers as well. But of course, for OPA, this is really what we're interested in because we want to kind of extend Kubernetes with our own rules. And again, if you paid attention, this is basically what oh, this is basically the the policy decision model, right? You have something that a service that takes a request, rather than making a decision of its own, it's passing that on to OPA, and then has has OPA made uh, make that decision. So we're going to zoom in here on the validating one. So we don't really do off authentication with OPA, but uh, authorization and, and the mutation or validation is, is basically what we do here. So I'm going to zoom in on, on validate, validating admission controller. And the reason I you know, choose that is uh, it's by far the most popular module to extend. And the, the reason that, that is so is that it allow, allows us to build these kind of policy-based guardrails around our clusters. So some common policies uh, to, that are kind of popularly enforced is to have rules that say like you can you can pull down any uh, image you want, but it must be from the from the company registry. Some uh, organizational things like any resource deployed must have a tag or an annotation, a label which says which whoever uh, it's kind of labels who whoever deployed it, the team name or the cost center and so on. So, so definitely not just about security. Like these kind of rules and policies can be uh, about anything really. Uh, ingress and host path uniqueness. That's another one, and that's an interesting one because it requires some knowledge, not just uh, not just hard coded in policy, but you also actually need to to uh, know what other things are deployed previously so there's no conflict when we, when we deploy this. TLS for your service configurations. Uh, you might want to deny certain attributes like host path value mounts. You might, might want to enforce uh, some uh, limits on resource allocation, uh, pod security policies, and yeah, basically anything you can think of. So if there's any rule you might want to have, uh, OPA is your friend. And just to provide a very, uh, a very simplified example, but if you, if you uh, remember from the demo here, we had an, we had an input, which was just a, a JSON file. And this is exactly what we'll get from the Kubernetes API server. In this case, it's going to be uh, in the form of an admission review object. So just uh, have some JSON data here where we see, okay, these are the, the containers which are about to be deployed. We have a simple policy in the middle which says, if not input request, object metadata labels dot cost center, then every resource must have a cost center. In this case, we return a string so that the admin actually knows. It's, it's not very useful if we were to just say deny here, because how, how would you know what, uh, what to fix? So in this case, we just say every resource must have a cost center label. And that error message is going to be propagated back to the user who made the request so that they can uh, remediate that. Authorization, another uh, popular use case or common use case. And uh, I'm not going to go into all of the details around authorization. It's, it's such a uh, complicated and big topic. But just to provide like a, a, a bit of an overview of, of, of what OPA might uh, what an OPA deployment might look like in that context. So in this case, kind of remember the, the policy deployment or, or different deployment models in an ideal scenario would keep OPA as close to our services as possible and not just have like one OPA server where, where that they would all go and query. So in this case, we, can, we have deployed OPA in all these individual services. We have an identity system, which is also decoupled and, and those have been properly decoupled for the last 20 years or so. But authorization has, up until now, kind of been uh, still very much uh, hard-coded in, into our application logic. But, but now we've, so we have an identity system. We know who the user is. That user would uh, popularly or commonly be represented using a token. This might be a JSON web token or something, so, uh, which is then passed along in all these requests. So we know who the user is. Uh, we know uh, the request method. We know things, whatever details we need to make uh, an authorized or to make an informed decision. And uh, 
when you see this, you might you might ask like, why, why can't we just why can't we not not just put Opa in, in the first service? Uh, and that's that's basically how we did authorization for uh, in the past. We used to put that kind of decision in, in a gateway or somewhere uh, where we'd authorize the request and then we just let it through. This kind of zero cross security model says that, that that's not a good idea because of course once you once if you made it past that first uh, step. It's basically an open highway. You can do anything because uh, the request is just assumed to have been authorized somewhere. And once that assumption breaks, uh, yeah, that's a pretty uh, bad place to be. And another, another problem with that model is, of course, uh, one of these services might run a cron job, uh, which would then be behind uh, the gateway and, and would, then, would, it, would then also not be authorized. So. So the, the zero trust security model, it, it kind of mandates that you do authorization uh, in all these locations. Uh, in this case, we have a control plane as well. Uh, the arrows here do not, does not mean that OPA is going to reach out uh, as a synchronous action. This is kind of what you, you were asking about before. So OPA does not reach out to this control plane when a policy is evaluated, but it rather goes there periodically to fetch new policy and new data and whatever else it might need. And the, with the control plane, you get more things like decision logging. So any decision OPA ever made is sent back to that control plane, where you can then later follow up. How many violations did we have in our cluster? Uh, are our OPAs, are they all healthy? Are they all up and running? And so on. And uh, yeah, Styra, the, the company I work for, we, we provide such a control plane. But there are, uh, but basically, in, in order to just serve policies, you can just set up an Nginx or an S3 bucket or something to get started. So you can go from very simple uh, models to, to more advanced. All right, so uh, that was an introduction to OPA. And uh, if you think this sounds interesting, uh, some advice for getting started. I think starting small is uh, a good thing. So similar to what we did in the demo, just try and write a few simple policies and rules, and kind of build experience from that. Uh, again, the OPA docs are uh, a great resource. So get a feel for all the, the basics of, of the, the, the Rego language, uh, all the built-ins or built-in functions available. And then with some knowledge on the basics, then I think like consider start to consider possible applications near to you. So some if you have a microservice or something like start there, uh, and and uh, and then try it out. And again, you don't need to rewrite your whole application to to use OPA. You could just start with a single endpoint, maybe a single role, maybe have the admin uh, check go via OPA and and have OPA decide is is this user an admin or not. And from there, you can scale up. Uh, I mentioned uh, the management possibilities or capabilities, things like logging, uh, providing policies, and data via bundle servers, and so on. And that's obviously the, the Styra DAS, which is the commercial control plane from Styra. Uh, and, and I should say there's a, a free edition as well, which, is, uh, which you can all try out. There's the Styra Academy, which is another good uh, learning resource. And there's the OPA Slack community, where we're, uh, where we're a lot of friendly faces going to, that are ha happy to help you uh, on your OPA journey. All right, uh, any questions? Do you have any firewall integration to say this go firewall function? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I, I know there are, I have seen a few, uh, like community projects for for working with that, but I think uh, in general, it's uh, it's it's not going to be at the layer of the the firewall, but rather more of these kind of API gateways where you have like H where you can work with uh, HTTP or in JSON and not just uh, kind of more low level rules. But uh, but yeah, if if they have like a some pluggable system for for writing rules, I'm sure OPA could fit right in. It seems like when you move to OPA, you move from a system where authentication is a distributed problem, 
and you move into a system where all of the rules are coming into one system, do you find that gets really complex and how do you manage it? Uh, yeah, so the, so the question was, uh, when, when you move from OPA, you, can, you move from a distributed system to a unified system, or, yeah. So and I, I think it, and, and, and the kind of complexity that comes with that, uh, I think it's, it's basically the other way around. When you do have your rules distributed in all these different systems, and they're written in different programming languages and so on, it's very hard to know what rules are deployed at any time or uh, without going out, especially if they're all managed by these different teams. And, and it's pretty much how I got into OPA. We were looking to, to solve authorization for a big company. We had, I think we had eight or nine uh, programming languages running in our clusters. And we, we wanted to ensure like, and if we were to just say like, we, we want these or that, uh, these are the rules we want in all our systems. We kind of knew that if we were just to, to go out to all these teams, they would all implement it differently. And uh, probably not by, like because it, because it's just like uh, there are so many kind of uh, ambiguities or like things that aren't really clear uh, and how to interpret rules and so on so we, we kind of needed one way where we could say like here are the rules they're all in one place and uh, and then that those rules are kind of distributed to all these components but they have a, a, a single place where they live and they're all defined using a common language final rule file starts to get very large and comes to something in a big complex system and how would you go about managing it? Are there tools to help you, you know, validate it? Oh uh, yeah, yeah sure. Um, so the rules themselves, then they don't have to live in a single file or so. So you can have as many files and modules as you want and you can use imports and so on. You can have like common libraries. So there's a, there are many ways to work with uh, OPA and Rego for larger and more complex systems that will help you. Yeah, I think that's going to be a look a bit different uh, depending on where, where you go. Uh, but yeah, I think that's it's basically one of the one of the good things or one of the premises of like uh, of, of treating policy as code is of course that you can use you can treat uh, Rego as as you would with any other code. So you have version control, you have things like testing, uh, code reviews. So any any change to policy must be reviewed by two other two members of the security team or, or whatnot. So it's it's basically an, another benefit of this approach. All right, I think that's it then. So thank you.